May I invite uh, Yamini Ayer next on the dais to take us through the proceedings of CPI Dialogues 2020? Thank you, Mukta. And on behalf of the Center for Policy Research, a very, very uh, warm welcome to all of you and a heartfelt thank you to External Affairs Minister Dr. Jay Shankar for taking the time to be here with us. Much of what uh, Dr. Shankar, Jay Shankar mentioned during his opening remarks, I think, set the context and framework for what we hope to do over the next two days. Dr. Jay Shankar talked about India uh, uh, re, re, so, so building towards a global mindset, addressing contemporary challenges of technology, climate change, pandemics, uh, and engaging uh, more in an interconnected world. Much of these, many of these issues are issues that the Center for Policy Research has been actively involved in from a research perspective. Uh, and it is on the back of this research that we felt it was important to start engaging in a more open public dialogue on, on many of these issues, both because these issues now uh, frame the context in which policy making is going to take place, but also because these issues are in and of themselves deeply contentious and require careful thinking, careful debate, uh, robust argumentation, and most importantly, evidence. Um, and this is what we as an institution seek to bring to the table uh, to these debates, particularly in the current context where public discourse has increasingly become polarized, uh, increasingly been reduced to 150 characters, or I believe now 250 characters, uh, but without the space uh, for serious engagement. Um, and it is with that uh, 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 at the back of our minds that we created the platform of the CPR Dialogues, where we bring together our research uh, and our community of academics, of policymakers, of practitioners, and civil society actors, of journalists, to engage in a dialogue and debate. Through the course of the next two days, uh, as Dr. Gopinath uh, also mentioned, we hope to cover quite a range of issues uh, that, uh, uh, th that, that now are front and center of the research work that we do at the center. We begin with a session on geopolitics, sort of taking forward some of the ideas uh, that, uh, uh, that we began today's deliberations with, uh, with, a, uh, with a moderated panel discussion where we have two uh, eminent personalities who've come from far far and wide, and amidst uh, all the uh, uncertainty of coronavirus and, and everything else, uh, it was a great sigh of relief that we were able to welcome Professor James Steinberg and Professor Frank Pike to Delhi uh, late last night uh, and uh, are now bothering them first thing in the morning to come here. Thank you very much for taking the time to be here and for making it as well. We then move on uh, to the next critical concern, uh, which is on jobs, both from the perspective of the challenge of, uh, of, 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 of jobs in India, where unemployment rates are in at, at an unprecedented high, but looking at this question also from the lens of the big questions that we confront going forward, what does a technology-based e economy mean for the challenge of jobs, and particularly applying a gender lens to this question, looking at how technology-based platforms uh, could well be an enabler for uh, strengthening female labor force participation or not. That's the question that we hope to answer uh, through our discussion on jobs. For much of the afternoon, uh, we, th we are looking at um, a new set of issues uh, around state capacity. Uh, much of our work at the Center for Policy Research that has focused on critical policy issues through a technocratic perspective always arrive at the one big uh, question that anyone who engages with the Indian state confronts. What does it take to build the administrative capability? What does it build, take to strengthen the Indian state to be genuinely responsive, capable, and capacitated to address the challenges that it confronts today? These challenges are not only the challenges of the 21st century that we talked about uh, in, uh, in the session just now, but also challenges of the past, 
India today has many unfulfilled promises of the 19th and 20th century, uh, uh, particularly on the human development agenda, as it also confronts new challenges going forward. Uh, and in all our work, we, we come to this question. And it is because we came to that question that we felt it was important to create an initiative within the center that actually tackles uh, the challenge of the Indian state front and center. Uh, so much of what we are going to do this afternoon is going to be on addressing this question. We have a session on, on the role of technology and administrative reforms, and we also have a session that formally launches our state capacity initiative later this evening. Interspersed, we pick up two other very, very critical issues. One on agriculture. You cannot talk about the Indian economy without talking about agriculture. Uh, and one of the big concerns with agriculture has been that even as we all acknowledge the challenge of agriculture, we really just, from a policy perspective, hope to wish it away. No matter how much we say that we need to double farmers' income, our real approach to doubling farmers' income is trying to get more and more people off the farm without building agricultural productivity. So we have a provocative session this afternoon titled, What Would It Take to Believe in Indian Agriculture to Really Strengthen Its Productivity and Ensure Not Only That Those Who Are On Farm genuinely double their incomes, but also have options to move out off farm in a manner that is sustainable and effective. This again is a newer area of research. It's actually, it's an old area of research that CPR used to be involved in in the 90s uh, and early 2000s, but over time uh, petered out and now we are trying to rebuild uh, at the center. We also have a very important discussion on technology, uh, not from the perspective just of technology as a tool or an enabler or a disabler of administrative reform, but from the larger question of how technology is beginning to impact every aspect of our social and uh, political life as well as therefore our policy life. And that confronts us with an important question of what it would take to create a legal framework that would genuinely protect rights of citizens, while at the same time ensuring and enabling innovation to flourish. So how does law and technology intersect and interface with each other is also a session that we will have later this afternoon. So it's a, uh, it's a wide range of issues, all of which are very relevant to the critical issue that we will discuss now, the changing global order and India's role. May I invite Mukta to take us through to the next session. Thank you, Yamini. Without further ado, I think uh, we're running a little bit late, and let's try not to uh, further that delay. So may I invite up on the dais here, um, first, Ambassador Shamsaran, who will be uh, moderating this discussion, and uh, then uh, James Steinberg, former United States Deputy Secretary of State and professor at the Maxwell School of Citizenship and Public Affairs. So please do join us. And Professor Frank N. Pique, Professor of Modern China Studies at Leiden University. Could I also ask you to join in? So, Jim, welcome to you. Frank, a very warm welcome to you as well. Okay. Uh, thank you for traveling from afar uh, to join us uh, in this uh, conversation. You just heard uh, a very enlightening speech, I would say, by uh, the Indian Foreign Minister, uh, which, in fact, is with many of the issues that we would like to cover in our conversation. Uh, Jim, we've just had uh, a very important visit by uh, President uh, Trump. And um, there has been a very uh, positive 
fallout uh, in terms of uh, at least what the public perception is about uh, the relationship. Uh, at this point of time, uh, having seen the trajectory that India-US relations have uh, taken over the last uh, several years, uh, where do you situate uh, this relationship in the context of what the foreign minister was mentioning, uh, a very, very, uh, you know, transforming kind of global uh, geopolitical landscape? Well, it's a great question. And thank, first of all, thank you for inviting me. It's great to be here. It's always a pleasure. And, and, uh, and I really think the minister set the stage really nicely because he really framed what I think is the real challenge of our time, uh, which is this um, uh, paradox, and it's a, a disturbing paradox, uh, of a time in which the, there's probably never been a greater need for global cooperation and strong uh, institutions and arrangements to deal with transnational problems and the problems of interconnectivity uh, that we see on the global stage rising nationalism, uh, a much more competitive international environment, and a much more zero-sum approach to, to international relations. And um, you know, I think that um, what we see uh, in the development of U.S.-Indian relations is that the, the, the good news is that over the last 25 years, uh, we've seen a growing recognition of two things uh, on the U.S. side. One, the, the value and importance of the relationship with India. But second, the need to understand that that relationship can only be cultivated by respecting the independence of India as an international actor. And I think that's why the relationship has progressed the way it has. And I think it's been a really a secular, monotonic trajectory of improvement uh, since I've like to argue from the from uh, the very end period of the Clinton administration up until the present, and I think it is from recognizing that India is going to be an important international actor, that it's going to have its own views uh, that aren't always going to coincide with the United States, but that on the whole, uh, by respecting that independence, uh, the United States and India have enough shared interests and values that we can partner effectively. And I think that we see this in in, in the president's visit, but I think the downside is that. Um, by respecting each other and sort of not making any demands on each other, um, that both sides are failing to meet this challenge that the minister has identified, which is if we have a deficit of international governance, if we have a deficit of international cooperation right now, then it's not going to be enough for each country to attend to its own business and simply respect each other. We have to find ways to energize the, 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 the system of international cooperation. It has to change. It's not going to be a US-led system anymore, but we need something to replace that. And I guess for me, the, the deficit of the visit was that there was no attention to that problem. A lot of respect, a lot of uh, focus on, on bilateral cooperation, but no attention to these overriding issues of our time. But would you not say that, uh, for example, the fact that the two countries have really uh, strengthened, for example, counterterrorism cooperation? I mean, which is, in a sense, an international uh, challenge or what we have been trying to do, say, what is now called the Indo-Pacific, you know, uh, upholding some sort of uh, rule of law, uh, trying to ensure that the whatever architecture which emerges in this region is a somewhat more balanced uh, architecture. Would you not say that there is a certain, I mean, in that, that dimension that you are talking about, uh, not perhaps uh, in, in, in a manner that we would have liked, but at least there are issues on which the two countries uh, seem to be working on a global basis. But don't forget that they have declared this to be a global comprehensive partnership. I, I get that, uh, but I, I still see the deficit on the global side. I mean, I, I mean obviously, where our interests converge, yeah. um, which is clearly a, a shared interest in dealing with, with counterterrorism, um, then there has been progress. And similarly, I think to the extent that both sides are concerned about the rise of China and are trying to think about how we organize affairs uh, in the broader Pacific region. But it, it still is not, in my mind, addressing precisely what the minister identified, which is the need for uh, an approach which allows for greater yeah. global cooperation. And yeah. I think that the, the, there needs to be mechanisms and institutions that, that, uh, that reflect that. And I think that's where okay. the current deficit lies. Uh, Frank, do you think that in that respect, in terms of you know what the Euro Euro European Union and what India can do together uh, to be able to address some of these uh, issues which are of uh, global dimension, global challenges. We are looking at climate change. We are looking at energy. 
Uh, we are now looking at uh, coronavirus as a public health uh, challenge. Uh, do you see that there is, perhaps in that respect, there seems to be a, a, a closer convergence between you and India? Um, I'm not sure that there is convergence, but there's definitely um, a, a budding interest in India in, in Europe. There have been several dialogues, EU-India dialogues already, and one is currently happening, or will happen very shortly. Um, in the last year and a half, I've been involved both in Holland and in Germany with uh, interdepartmental uh, discussions about uh, what should be done with India. But it's all very buddy. It's not something that um, uh, built on a solid base. Uh, for many European countries or governments, India, surprisingly enough, is something that is new. They don't quite know what to do with it. Um, so I've been asked the question both in Germany and Holland. So, so what is India really? What does it mean for us? And what can we do with that? How does that compare to China? Um, and they are a little bit at a loss, which is surprising to me. I'm not talking about England, of course, the UK, that's a different story, but um, continental Europe doesn't know India as a global player yet. Well, I'm surprised that you uh, say that because, you know, uh, I was uh, Foreign Secretary at the time uh, in 2004, November 2004, where India and the European Union uh, declared a strategic partnership. Sure. Of course, sure. uh, much abused uh, <laughs> praise, <laughs> uh, perhaps has been mm -hmm. has been um, hollowed out of its meaning. But uh, it was important that uh, EU and India, for the first time, uh, actually came together, and uh, the strength of convergence was very strong. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Uh, for example, uh, we talked about terrorism. That was the time, if you remember, there was the first stabbing incident. Uh, in 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 the, the Netherlands, I think uh, yeah, it was, was uh, Van Gogh. Yeah, uh, and Europe suddenly woke up to the fact that uh, Europe too has a problem with uh, with uh, terrorism and radicalism. Mm -hmm. Sure. Um, there was the issue of climate change, mm -hmm. and uh, the the point that we were making that uh, you know energy choices that India makes mm -hmm. are not only going to be important for India. Mm -hmm but they are also going to be very important for the rest of the world, including uh, Europe. Uh, you know, that was the time when oil prices were going through the roof. Uh, there was, uh, you know, a great deal of concern about uh, how the world is going to cope with the rising energy demands of continental sized economies like China, like mm -hmm. India. Uh, and so there was a sense that uh, Europe and India uh, actually can work together to mm -hmm. deal with uh, issues which also have a very major impact on climate change. Mm -hmm. uh, sure. And Europe and India should be working together uh, on that. Uh, there was also a sense that um, with regard to uh, uh, Europe and India, here are two entities mm -hmm. which are multi-ethnic, they are multicultural, they are multi-religious, they are plural democracy, mm -hmm. you know, multilingual as mm -hmm. well. Um, so there is, there is actually uh, both have a certain certain uh, commonality of, uh, mm -hmm. of of political values of of, uh, of uh, you know uh, a democratic kind of frame, uh, and each therefore has a stake mm -hmm. in the success of the other. Sure, very important. And lastly, it was that if we are looking at a more multipolar world emerging. India, right from the beginning, has been a great champion of European unity because it has always seen that in terms of its preference for multipolarity, a strong united Europe could actually be a very important partner in this multipolar world. So I'm, so I'm, I'm very disappointed that <laughs> well, <laughs> it appears to be that uh, Europe has suddenly lost uh, interest in India. No, no, the point is that they are getting interested again. It seems that they had forgotten about India a little bit, and now they are waking up to India for the re some of the reasons that you outlined. Um, India and the EU also share something else, and that they are both potential global players who aren't really yet. Um, and they, they're still looking for ways to, to build up that role and assert that role um, in their own different ways, of course. Um, but they're not quite sure exactly how that's going to play out. So in that sense, actually, there is both commonality and a great potential for cooperation. They sort of, well, it's strange to talk about Europe perhaps as a rising power, <laughs> but as a global player, a unified global player, that's really what it can be. 
but it seems to be a reluctant power. Absolutely, yeah. yes, yes. Uh, but there is now a more, a more of an appetite, I would yeah. say, uh, in France, of course, in particular, because the French always think about themselves as being a great power, and Europe for them is a vehicle for French great power anyway. But even the Germans reluctantly are starting to think, well, we have to join forces because we, we can't rely on the system, the world system. So well. let me ask you, is there a certain European view with regard to you know, the, what the foreign minister was mentioning, that we are going through a very uh, a period of great transition, mm -hmm. of transformation, uh, and we don't quite know where the cards will fall mm -hmm. uh, when all this uh, starts settling down. Uh, how does uh, how does Europe see uh, this change yes, well, taking but place? There, there, the diversity actually works against Europe, because um, don't forget it is um, a lot of different countries that have joined the EU for very different reasons. And I mentioned France. France uses or thinks of the EU as a way of being a global player, a great power, and so on and so forth. For Germany, Europe is basically a way to get peace in in its in its neighbourhood and to assert itself as an economic power. Then you go to the other side of Europe, to Eastern Europe, and several countries have joined essentially because they are interested in what Brussels can bring in terms of subsidies and support. Poland is more interested in the geostrategic security vis-a-vis -vis vis -vis Russia that the EU can bring, and so on and so forth. So there's all these different agendas, um, which are very difficult, difficult to square. Um, so when you talk about the idea that, yes, Europe should become more of a global player, which I believe in, um, and should assert its, um, its strategic uh, autonomy, then the question really immediately arises, so what does that really mean on the ground? What do you in this country mean by that, and what do you mean by that? And in that sense, not being a federation, being essentially a, a customs union, really works against the But EU. would you not say the fact that, you know, uh, whether we like it or not, the United States is somewhat losing interest in the uh, Atlantic Alliance. Absolutely. Uh, well, okay. well <laughs> let's, let's, let's park that. Uh, okay. Right? <laughs> uh, isn't, it, is, isn't it almost uh, a compulsion for Europe to come together? Uh, um, I mean, don't your interests in, in terms of safeguarding your interests demand that you should have that kind of coherence? Um, I wish I were able to say yes to that. <laughs> <laughs> but I'm, I'm afraid that um, the self-evidence of the European project um, has been challenged over the last 20 years, of course, and it continues to be challenged. And Europe, much more than in the past, has to sell itself. Um, and don't forget, Europe has made great mistakes over the last 20 years in its strategy, in the way it's been developing, in the way it's been building itself up. And it's still very much in the process of trying to somehow correct these. Yeah, so my last comment. Um, therefore, I think what we have seen over the last several years is that while the profile of India-EU relationship mm -hmm. and strategic partnership has diminished, mm -hmm. uh, our bilateral relations with some of the important actors in Europe, uh, in particular, I would say Germany, has really, mm -hmm. uh, become sure. very, very much uh, stronger. Uh, so from what you have said, I would expect that that trend probably needs to continue. Well, but there's of course also the other thing that I already mentioned, and that is I think the EU and India really do actually need each other because their global interests are no longer taken care of by the United States. They have to assert themselves vis-a-vis -vis China, and, and there's um, a, a natural way of cooperation there. There is a natural way for a reason for Europe to be a global player. I don't think Europe can afford to sit back and enjoy the ride anymore. And in, as such, it has to uh, sort of improve on, on its act and work with countries like India that face a similar challenge. Yeah, okay. Um, Jim, uh, with, uh, with respect to, again, this uh, transition uh, that we are uh, talking about, uh, if I'm a decision maker sitting in Delhi and looking at the challenges that India uh, faces and where does U.S become a very important uh, partner for us. If one is looking uh, from, the, from, from that point of view uh, towards the east, on the eastern flank of India, I see that there is a greater convergence of interest between the US uh, and India, which is reflected in this uh, strategy of uh, you know, strengthening cooperation in the Indo-Pacific. We are looking at 
a slow but steady crystallization of the quad that we have been talking about. Mm -hmm. But if I look to the western flank, we just talked about you know, what is happening in Afghanistan. Uh, what, for example, is uh, US policy with respect to, say, Iran or the Gulf region, uh, which for India, again, as I said, for somebody sitting here in Delhi, uh, that cannot be separated uh, from what is happening in the East. I mean, if you are looking at the Chinese challenge, the Chinese challenge is not just for us in the, in the Indo-Pacific or South China Sea, yeah. but in some ways, because of its alliance with Pakistan, it's, uh, it's a much more, uh, shall I say, high-profile threat uh, than it would otherwise be. And what we see happening, as I said, in Afghanistan, where, they, where the U.S. interest does not seem to be aligned with what India sees as interest. How, how do you think we can, we can, we can you know, manage this contradiction? So I think the problem, from my perspective, and I I'm, accept the fact that this is not every American view of the problem, is that we're misconceiving the problem, right? which is that our common interest to your West is stability in that region, right? That we have, we still have significant interest in the energy resources coming from the Middle East. We have significant interest in not having radicalism emerge from the Middle East. And therefore, um, we, we have a shared need to have stability and not to see this as a reconstruction of the great game. And I think that the problem for certainly in the United States, and I think there's a risk for India, is to see all of this as just a recreation of the great game with China now being the actor as opposed to Russia in the 19th century. And so if we understand that all of us have a shared interest in stability in the Middle East, China, India, the United States, Europe, that, that we think of the problem very differently than in terms of a zero-sum competition for influence. And I think that's been the failure uh, of, the, of all of us, is to see where the shared interests are and to see that the problems of economic development, of eth ethnic conflict and the like, in the region is a problem for all of us that we should have a shared interest in and try to find some ways to deal with it. Um, the fact is, and this will, I don't want to sound partisan, but when, in dealing with Iran, the great success of the previous administration was to see the shared interest between Russia, China, Europe, the United States, and our partners in the region, which, in China, which you absolutely yeah. were supportive of, mm -hmm. in, in stabilizing the situation with Iran, because you have an interest yeah. in a constructive relationship with Iran, too. And we had problems in the bilateral relationship between the United States and India when we were demanding of you to have a, uh, a confrontational uh, attitude towards Iran, because we, that was what we were doing. And conversely, when we saw this as a shared interest in trying to stabilize the, the, the situation, beginning with the nuclear program, that we found common ground among the six with the support of India. So I think we need to get back to that perspective, to think about the fact that rather than seeing this as, a, as an arena for competition, where the United States sees China as a threat, as Russia as a threat, <laughs> as Iran as a threat, to think about where the shared interests are and to try to, and I think India can play a leading role there because I think you have a more nuanced view about what's needed in the region. As, and, I, as, I, as, I, as I mentioned that, uh, you know, for us, uh, this uh, region is extremely important, uh, not only because of the fact that uh, it is the main source of high energy supplies, um, very important that there are perhaps today the figures are a bit, uh, bit uh, hazy at the moment, but maybe about six million Indians who live and work uh, in the uh, Gulf. Uh, and also I would say that India has a strong interest in not allowing the sort of sectarian uh, conflict in the region, which is the Shia Sunni right. conflict, uh, in, in any way uh, sort of um, you know, impacting of on what is uh, a fairly delicate kind of a you know, uh, social situation uh, in India. Uh, also, Iran, uh, in terms of uh, our, uh, any kind of Central Asian policy or any kind of Afghan policy, uh, Iran is going to be a Absolutely. critical actor. Absolutely. Mm -hmm. uh, and if the United States of America is looking at every move that India makes with Iran as somehow, you know, contrary exactly. to... Exactly. No, and and as I said, I, mean, I think that's a lesson that we learned yeah. um, from you was to see this. I mean, we obviously feel challenges from Iran and, and are worried about not just the nuclear program, but worried about the sense that Iran may have you know, broader objectives in the region in terms of its own spheres of influence, right? And we have important partners that, that feel threatened by that. But I think the, the, the answer that the Obama administration came up with 
is to try to find a way first to stabilize the relationship and then to see whether there are ways to try, try to do these things, as opposed to see this in a kind of a Manichaean, black and white, mm -hmm. you know, evil empire mm -hmm. approach to the problem of Iran. One shouldn't underestimate the destabilizing effects of certain aspects of Iranian foreign policy. But on the other hand, simply a confrontational strategy across the board uh, is not going to help stabilize How much is, is this impacted by uh, the influence which uh, Israel uh, has on, on this aspect of Israel? I, I'm not so is sure it, that, it, no? that I'm not, not in a big way, in the sense that I think that although Israel did not support the nuclear deal, I think Israel is sensitive to the need not to inflame the region to the point where it becomes a threat to Israel itself. So I think this is driven more by the internal debate in the United States rather than by external mm -hmm. forces. Yeah, okay. Uh, many people say that, uh, you know, the fact that the United States of America is now, I think, the largest uh, producer of oil and gas uh, in the world and it's becoming a major exporter. In fact, one of the results of the Trump visit was a decision to increase, uh, you know, the energy partnership between India and the U.S. and uh, India being able to uh, access much more supplies, uh, particularly of natural gas from uh, the United States. Uh, that, you know, a very important reason why the U.S. has been very closely involved with the region and has had in the past some interest in terms of, you know, uh, contributing to the political stability in the region uh, no longer exists. Right, that, that, uh, you know, it's, it, I, I teach this to my students all the time. It is the <laughs> okay. most flawed view of the way the global energy economy works that you could possibly imagine. It's somehow because we produce enough energy for domestic consumption that we're... So are, what is the answer said, you give Because to the answer is that the price of West Texas crude for somebody who's consuming gas in the United States is not set independent of the price of what's coming out of the, the oil fields in the Gulf. There's a world price for oil. And if there's instability or conflict in the, in the Middle East, it will raise the price of gas in the United States and of oil and of all petroleum products, even if technically we produce enough for ourselves. It is an integrated global economy. And therefore, the, unless every country were autarkic in energy, we would all still care. And so we cannot insulate ourselves economically or politically from these challenges just because we have, in, in some kind of uh, mechanical way, enough energy doesn't mean that the, the global price of energy doesn't affect the economy of the United States. It does. It raises the price in the United States if the price goes up because of shortages in the Gulf or because of conflict in the Gulf. Not to mention it's impacted all our partners, Japan, oh, sure. Europe. Uh, but so, so th this... But I mean, there is, this argument keeps coming out from Europe as well, that, mm -hmm. you know... <laughs> you can't... They, you can't that, this is, I mean, this is one of the great dangers that we're facing now. It's a sort of notion that, that countries can insulate themselves mm -hmm. from global interdependence by becoming economically autarkic, right? And there's a lot of that strain in the current Trump administration's mm -hmm. view about... Uh, international economics, that somehow we can make all our own stuff, produce on our own stuff, depend only on our own markets, and be successful. And the answer is no. We yep. will all be poorer uh, for that. We know that, that, that the prosperity of the United States is inter intimately and, uh, and inextricably connected to yep. th these global markets. And if we try to decouple ourselves, as some people are now uh, advocating, we're all going to be poorer for that. Yep. So I think it is a mistake. I mean, you can debate the specifics about whether we need military presence in the Gulf or not, but to think that we're not affected by events in the region, I think, is just no, a misunderstanding of global I, economics. I, I, I can see that. So you uh, uh, brought up this issue of decoupling, uh, and this is also something which is very current these days, and I would mm -hmm. like to pose uh, the same uh, question to both of you. Um, there is no doubt, I mean, if we see the debate on the Huawei uh, issue, for example, uh, it appears to me, and correct me if I'm wrong, that uh, we do see some tendency towards decoupling when it comes to the high-tech, uh, uh, you know, segments uh, of the globalized economy. Uh, so there is a danger that uh, different kind of standards, technical standards, different kind of specifications uh, may, in fact, uh, come about as a result of this great fear that uh, China in artificial intelligence mm -hmm. or it is in, in, in uh, IT, uh, in all these areas, machine learning, uh, it, is, it is making an advance and we need to be able to protect uh, mm -hmm. ourselves. So in, in respect of those high-tech areas, we do see some 
effort to de decouple. Whether it's a good thing to do or not, that's a different matter. But that is something that is beginning to happen. The second thing is, my sense is that uh, with respect to these global supply chains, which are perhaps the most important element of the globalized economy, uh, while China is a very key player in those global chains, but one of the reasons why, for example, initiated the Belt and Road uh, Initiative. In a sense, it is in a very, very uh, sort of incipient way, uh, creating some of those value chains or attempting to create those value chains, which will be essentially dominated by Chinese companies, Chinese state companies, Chinese multinationals, rather than what is the case today, where most of those global value chains are led by either mm -hmm. European, Japanese, or American multinationals. Mm -hmm. uh, and the, the uh, Chinese vulnerability to that is very obvious today as a result of the coronavirus. Mm -hmm. Because you see suddenly that those global value chains are getting disrupted uh, mm -hmm. virtually all across. And that is also leading to people asking, isn't it better that perhaps we move away from mm -hmm. global value chains which are dominated by China uh, and into some, some other locations? Uh, so there is this aspect of decoupling, which is totally contrary to the globalization trend that we have been uh, talking about. Uh, uh, from, from, from your perspective, you know, and let me come to uh, you, Frank, first. Uh, how serious is this issue of decoupling? And how does Europe look at, for example, the high-tech high segment, where mm -hmm. this is perhaps much more pronounced than in other segments? Mm -hmm. uh, how do you see this playing itself out? Well, decoupling is, of course, um, an issue, as you outlined, in China. And China has had a surreptitious decoupling policy for several years already, without us really knowing or realizing that it did. Um, and, but we should also recognize the fact that it has been, by and large, successful for China. And uh, now the Americans are now coming with a much more, um, uh, let's say, a lot more propaganda, a lot more noise they make about decoupling. But really, they're coming late to the game, as it were. The Chinese have already prepared themselves for a world in which they have to compete more geostrategically, also in terms of trade um, and other economic uh, interdependencies. So that is really the challenge before us. And the Europeans um, are only now beginning to talk about these issues. Um, uh, in a very limited way. So, this so are we now reacting after the horse has bolted and we are trying to... Not quite, but yeah. we are late to the game. So the question really is, to what extent should we try with the Chinese and with the Americans trying to reignite the trade system, because the trade system is already under siege, is already crumbling. Um, it's not something that is a plan. It has already happened. It is currently in train. Um, from a European perspective, it's something that we were ill-prepared for because for a very long time we were simply happy to sit back and believe that the world trade system as it was would be taken care of and would serve Europe very, very well and would continue to do so. Now, only in the last two years have discussions in Europe really turned and people have been saying, beginning to say, what do we do with investment screening? What do we do with ex export controls? That's another one that is mentioned. What do we do with screening and monitoring of science and technology collaboration? How do we ensure that uh, our technological advantages uh, and, 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 and um, don't, are not transferred to China in particular? But it's a discussion. Um, it's not something that is really happening in a big way yet. Um, and my question really is, um, to what extent do we in Europe necessarily, will we necessarily have to follow what the Chinese are doing and what the Americans are doing, or can we continue, which is what I hope, to try to reignite, strengthen the current the system as it is, which has served us for such a long time? But I think, you know, there are two huge risks with this movement towards decoupling. The first is economic. The, it's indisputable, the fact that, that the trade-off we're making is for some sense of, of independence, significant less wealth. Right. I mean, the, the global growth, which everybody has benefited from, has largely been driven by trade and interdependence. So if we just if we turn the clock back, we will all make ourselves poorer. Now, we can choose to make ourselves poorer if we feel more secure and would rather be poor and secure. That's a choice. But the not second, for the first time. Not for the first time. And by the way, we did this in the 1930s, right? And, that, and that's the story I want to tell. It's because what we did is the story of what we did in the 1930s. And we made ourselves poorer, but we also created the stage for conflict. Because the more independent we feel from each other, 
the greater risks we're prepared to take to get into conflict with each other. If our, if our fates are not mutually interdependent, then we are, a, we are freer to engage in conflict with the other party mm -hmm. because we have less at risk. And so we're in a situation now where decoupling, which is driven by the sense of insecurity and vulnerability, will both make us poor and potentially much less secure because the risk of conflict between states grows as they have less and less at stake with each other. And that's what happened in the 1930s, right? As we became less and less dependent, uh, we, we, had, we had greater risk of conflict, and I think that's the direction we're going now. So mm -hmm. for me, um, the, the response is understandable but wrong-headed. And what we need to do is, in looking at China and Belt Road and its attempt to dominate global supply chains, is rather than to retreat behind walls and build walls, mm -hmm. it's to try to find ways to reinforce a more open and less dominated mm. set of interconnectivity, the way the minister talked about it. Interconnection is the strategy that India has been pursuing regionally, is, is in everybody's interest. Because as your interconnections grow, the prosperity of your neighbors grow, which contributes to India's prosperity, mm -hmm. but it also creates a sense of shared mutual faith, uh, which allows, on the political level, for states to try to work together more and to solve differences, rather than to go into conflict over those differences. So the strategy that we need is not to say Belt and Road is dangerous and we should all just cut off ties, but rather to say how do we make this more transparent, less dominated, less subject to corruption, uh, more open to free commerce, how to reinforce the global trading system, how to reinforce these levels of interconnectivity that give us a sense of shared mutual faith and shared mm -hmm. mutual interest that's a plus sum relationship between countries rather than a zero sum. Yep. Did you want to do yeah, I just want to add a little thing, yeah. and, I, I, and I fully agree with you. Um, you know, this is what I really would want, but um, unfortunately, globalization is not what has driven um, um, a great independence and therefore world peace, but it's the other way around. Globalization is the product, it's a consequence of a unipolar world that doesn't exist anymore. And that's why we're now in a world that is multipolar in a very real and tangible and dangerous way, and that necessarily, I think, I think will have to go, is going against globalization. It must. So I, I agree with that. And that's why I think, that going back to our very earliest part of the conversation and the minister's comments, that the biggest challenge of our time is to create, in a non-unipolar world, the, the institutional architecture that allows for continued cooperation. And so the question is, how do you do that if it's not going to be dictated by a hegemon? In our case, we thought mm -hmm. we were a benign hegemon. But nonetheless, can a multipolar world produce the infrastructure that allows this cooperation. So, so we need a strategy that is fundamentally different from Absolutely. 20 years ago. Absolutely. Well, two points I would like to make. One is that uh, I, I certainly accept your uh, point that you know the greater the uh, interdependency, the more dense the interconnections are. Uh, that does contribute to uh, a more uh, a, 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 a world in which uh, uh, countries act with a certain degree of restraint because there are obviously important uh, interests involved. And yet we have seen, for example, it has been talked about before also in history that in 1914 when you had the war, uh, world war, you had in fact uh, perhaps not to the same extent, but you had a lot of interconnections amongst the countries who became adversaries uh, during the war. So perhaps that's not always the guarantee that you will be able to avoid conflict. That is one point. The second point is that you mentioned that you know globalization uh, was the result of uh, some kind of a unipolar uh, mm -hmm. world. Uh, I'm not so sure whether that is right because uh, I feel that globalization is really the consequence of technology, technological change. Mm -hmm. I mean, more and more uh, of the, the kind of technology uh, development that we have mm -hmm. seen, whether it is IT, whether it is uh, digital economy, uh, mm -hmm. virtually all these technological changes have in fact been pushing us towards a world where borders mm -hmm. have become much less relevant than they were uh, in the past. What has been the downside, I'm, that's, that's my perspective, the downside has been it is not that globalization has led to all these uh, bad consequences, but it is a failure of public policy. That mm -hmm. is, the benefits which have come from globalization <laughs> have not been distributed right. as evenly as they should have been. There has been fewer winners, many large mm -hmm. you know, numbers of uh, losers. Mm -hmm. So it's not so much that uh, globalization is the problem. The globalization actually has led to, and I agree with you, a lot of uh, benefits, but, uh, uh, you know, uh, we have not been able to 
uh, deal with uh, some of the consequences of that globalization. Uh, so, in in terms of in terms of what uh, we see going forward, uh, one to me it appears that you need to have new governance systems for what are very new challenges, uh, and those governance systems can only operate on the basis of collaboration. Yeah. It's important that you collaborate. Thirdly, there has to be some sense of equitable burden sharing, some sense of justice in terms of those collaborative responses. So if we are talking about the new kind of a collaborative framework, even the weakest country can actually, you know, completely disrupt the entire system mm -hmm. if it is not if it is right. not a collaborative. I, I, I think that's exactly right. right. So how do we go about in, in, in that sense that you need to construct those new governance institutions? You need to have a very different kind of multilateral processes mm. uh, to be able to deal. Because you see, if you look at most of the governance systems that we have, mm. they are based on an assumption that states will compete with one another. Mm -hmm. So if you take, for example, the uh, global trading networks or, or you know, the, the governance system, it is based on the fact that countries will compete with each other. Mm -hmm. and not, therefore, no, see, I mean, that's not right. It's based on the idea that, that firms will compete with each well, other, but not okay, countries. Firms but, will that's, but that's important. <laughs> Because, because what's important about that well, is not to uh, see this the as, a, as a... more and more are aligning themselves to what they're... Uh, but that's why, that's why it's collapsed. So, yeah, well, it, it has collapsed not just uh, because of that. Because I think, you know, what you, what you have as a set of challenges which are, are very different from before. Mm. Earlier, the negotiating process, even in a multilateral setting, mm. negotiating processes came out with what was essentially a least common denominator result. Because if you have competing interests, where do you finally find some degree of convergence? Mm -hmm. It is usually at the lowest level. What you require today, if you are talking about, for example, climate change as an extraordinary challenge to the survival of humanity itself, uh, those kind of minimal responses will not work. You need, you know, mm. collaborative and you need very, very shall I say, dramatic, uh, mm. uh, you know, responses uh, to this. What my question to you is, what, is there something on which, if this is our, our diagnosis of what the uh, problem is, are there ways in which, for example, EU and India, United mm. States, uh, India and all of us together, mm. is there some way in which we can perhaps uh, move the discourse in that direction? I mean, I, I think there are two important points, which is because I, I, I do disagree with you about the, the, the trade system. The most important feature of the WTO and, and, and the general principle behind the GATT, MFN requirement, right, which was that, that every country would benefit at the MFN level from any agreement that was reached, right? So it was not a, uh, either a bilateral or a competitive model. It was that everybody would benefit from, from trade lowering that was done by anybody, right? So it was, a, it was an attempt to globalize and universalize the benefits. So it was not done with the view of, of trying to figure out what national advantage was, but rather a view that, that, that all nations benefited from the gradual lowering of barriers. And, and, and so that the strategy was precisely one to say that weaker countries were not going to be disadvantaged in the system because they didn't have bargaining power. They were going to benefit from the MFN provisions of the GATT. What we have now is this bilateral approach, which is now favored by our administration, which basically says we're going to use our dominant leverage to extract concessions from other countries for our benefit, to which nobody else benefits from. And nobody else gets the benefits of the tariff lowerings that we get through our bilateral negotiations. So that, that's a big change away mm -hmm. that focuses on a national advantage at the expense of weaker countries and of others. So mm -hmm. the, the basic principle of the, of the, of the GATT was mm -hmm. one, I think, that corresponds to what you're doing. It's not that countries didn't negotiate nationally when they tried to figure out what they were, but they understood that they couldn't just narrowly capture the benefits for themselves, that everybody in the system was going to get the benefits. Mm -hmm. Similarly, although I agree with you that the ambitions of Paris were modest, what was, what was strong about Paris was the idea that, it would, that, that results were not going to be dictated by the strong to the weak and that each country in, in determining its nationally uh, determined contributions could take into account its national level of development, its internal 
political arrangements and still contribute to the system with the view that the solidarity that was generated by not imposing conditions on some or taking advantage of, of political power. We see no solidarity in the subsequent negotiations. But, but, <laughs> but, 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 but the problem, what, what, what you don't know, right, is whether it is, it is the failure of the system or the failure of our leadership, frankly, on this. Well, you know, it's difficult to sort of separate the, the two. But le let me, let me uh, without belaboring the, this point, um, when we are talking about, for example, the WTO, you know, which is, which is almost defunct now, uh, but not just the WTO, but a number of other international institutions from the perspective of a developing country like India. I think one of the important characteristics of those processes and institutions was that they accepted the principle of differentiation, that you cannot put advanced developed countries on the same level as developing mm -hmm. countries. Mm -hmm. Therefore, there would be differential treatment. Uh, in terms of, you know, what is expected of you in terms of your contribution uh, and what is expected of a developed country. Now, it was not always uh, ideal the way you constructed uh, that, that uh, institution or processes, but by and large, it accepted that principle. I think what is different today, whether it is with respect to climate change or it is with respect to trade, that, the, that particular principle of differentiation uh, no longer exists. Yeah. That it is now a question of reciprocity. That yeah. what is it that you bring to the table and what I bring to the table and whether or not they match or not. So you have a very different kind of a uh, impulse behind the kind of changes that are taking place in terms of the global uh, order. My sense is, again I may be wrong, my sense is that with regard to a lot of the developing countries like India, which is the point I tried to make in, 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 the, in the conversation with the uh, uh, foreign minister, that you know, we, have, we have a difficult task because, yes, we are a major player on the international stage. Mm. And yet, a lot of our developmental challenges put us in a, in a very different uh, category. And how to manage that tension is really at the heart of what, what we are uh, trying to... Uh, I agree, but that, that's why, again, coming back to Paris, I mean, I think that the strength of the Paris approach was, was for you precisely to make those judgments about what was possible in the context of India's situation. Well, uh, we made a choice, uh, 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 again, I mean, that's, that's, uh, that's a matter of debate, but, uh, you know, one of the principles which we lost was precisely the principle of differentiation. I, I don't see how you can say that when India's <laughs> own nationally determined contributions were determined by your own because, sense of what... Because in working out what we are going to be doing in the future, uh, you have not taken into account what was a very important principle in the climate, uh, climate uh, regime, the UNFCC, that there is a certain principle of historical responsibility that you need uh, to take. You're not to see this differently. I think, I think it's precisely... <laughs> I know. This is, this is an issue on which there is a lot of difference, but I mean, no, but that it, just points to... But, it, but it, I, I'm agreeing with you by the fact that if you expect... I mean, if, this goes to the broader question about the acceptability of globalization, right? Which is that, and I take the minister's point was a very thoughtful one on this, which is that um, if you have to develop the domestic consensus in favor of participation in the global system, and you can't impose it on your domestic politics, especially in a democratic country like India or the United States. And the failure that Frank was talking about is that part of the reason why we've had this backlash against globalization is because none of the, the leaders who advocate for globalization ever built the domestic constituencies in yeah. favor of it. And so you can't, you know, as, as Colin Powell said, you don't get too far out over your skis, sure. right? And, and so we have to accept the fact that for India to participate as a global player, it has to be able to gain the support of the people who have to deal with all the developmental challenges that take place in India. And the system has to accommodate that and to recognize that domestic politics is serious and is the fundamental basis for the sustainability of globalization. But that, that shouldn't lead us to back away from the fact that unless countries contribute to some sense of shared, shared future and shared interest in the, in the global health of the system, that a competitive beggar thy neighbor strategy that looks at how do you maximize your advantage in any given case mm. is going to lead to everybody being worse off. Uh, well, 
theoretically yes but when it mm. actually comes down to negotiating the the nuts and bolts uh, perhaps <laughs> a different dynamic comes in you want it to come in i just want to say a few things first of all um, if you talk about globalization only in terms of trade and other terms of interdependence then you're missing the point about what's currently happening and that is the weaponization of trade of globalization for the interests in particular of in, in china and the united states so Globalization and trade and independence are now uh, weapons, are tools to fight out conflicts between great powers. Um, so as such, the whole debate has moved beyond globalization already, uh, which is deplorable, um, but it is nevertheless, unfortunately... So how uh, do we deal with it? You don't deal with it. You have to basically now start trying to live with that new reality that you see great powers using interdependence to serve their own geostrategic aims. Um, that is just a fact on the ground, whether we like, I dislike that very much, um, but it's a fact and we have to learn to deal with it. In Europe, we aren't even remotely there to think about that and come up with some kinds of ways of dealing with that sensibly, but we have to in a hurry. Another point that I want to make um, is that uh, we should nevertheless try to restrict uh, our, um, our, our need, um, our impulses to punish uh, our enemies or to punish the free riders or to punish the people who abuse a system um, because that leads to um, uh, disaster. And the EU in the Euro crisis has seen exactly that. The EU and the, the Euro and the EU went almost belly up because of the desire of Germany, Holland, and a couple of other countries to punish Greece for its free riding, for its mendacity, for its, 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 the horrible things that have been done for many, many years. They were really naughty boys, um, but nevertheless trying to punish them, them had exactly the opposite result of what you want to achieve. You want to achieve, what you want to achieve is save the system, you ended up almost killing it off. Yeah, and agree. it was only told by Getting, well, this is a very depressing time. note to <laughs> <laughs> to end this conversation. We have about uh, 15 minutes. Would you be uh, open to uh, having some questions please. from the audience? Welcome. So we'll take some questions, three questions in the first round. Yes, please. Please identify yourself and make your question short. C could you give the mic, please? I'll come to you. Good morning. And if there is any specific uh, panelist you want to address that question to, please indicate. Yeah, it's, my question is for any of you. My name is Shubda. Uh, my question is that in the since we are talking about globalization and decoupling together, what do you think of Emmanuel Wallerstein's theory of you know core periphery and semi-periphery countries, okay. and has the impact of globalization and decoupling changed it, or? Is it redundant now, or is it even more meaningful now? The, Thank the you. contrast between the periphery and the center, or what? The core, semi-periphery, mm. and yeah. periphery model of Emmanuel uh, Wallerstein. Okay. Yeah. Okay. Thank you. Um, yes, I will come. Two questions to Professor Steinberg, one for Frank. Oh, President Trump can't stop talking about the crowd which received him. I think 100, 150,000 crowd and whatever was the highest he has ever seen. And since then he has been paying the highest tribute to Prime Minister Modi. I don't think he has spoken so effusively about any world leader. And Taj Mahal might have played some its role, but when it came to press conference, I think the businessman Trump came out. He was still talking about India has one of the highest tariffs. He still gave example of Harley Davidson, mm. which I am told only 50 of them were exported last year. So, with this, uh, do you think how hopeful are you of a real the trade deal of the century, which the President talks about in the near future? Okay. So, so prospect, second, prospect for a trade deal. Okay. Uh, the next second question is this: For the last 20 years, Indo-US relations, the bipartisan support in the U.S. Congress Senate has been the hallmark. But is it getting breached now? Because you see in last uh, maybe six or nine months, so many Democratic leaders, Pamela Jaipal, for example, 
our resolution cast me now has got 56 supporters and presidential candidate bernie sanders has been talking about very okay. critically here's so, an asset whether we are losing that uh, asset which has been uh, last question please. yes please i'll come to you yeah, Manish Sharma, my basic question regarding uh, regarding uh, to Mr. James Steinberg is regarding the uh, question mark over capitalism. You know, we are seeing a lot of you know tax cuts. You know, a lot of trade uh, tariffs going up. You know, and a lot of inequality going up. As far as governments are concerned, a lot of deficits and de uh, you know, a lot of debt debt uh, government debt is going high, higher up. You know, and that is uh, really the cause of a lot of resentment. You know, as far as the common man is concerned. So, don't you feel that the whole system of capitalism is going to be uh, I mean, challenge, you know, with the rise of these uh, social democrats okay. like uh, Bernie Sanders. Okay, capitalism in crisis. Um, uh, Frank, would you like to take any of those uh, questions? Well, I was really sort of intrigued by the first question about core periphery and Wallace I mean, that's just a, um, a voice from the past for me, uh, as it were, um, when I was a young student, which is a long time ago, as you can see. Um, but you are a professor now. Yes, indeed. <laughs> um, I would think that... It, the, that model is still, I think, valid. Of course, it's a very crude model, a very simplistic model, but in its simplicity has a great deal of explanatory power and appeal. Um, you could almost say that decoupling, in a way, would reinforce um, inequalities in power relations between cores and peripheries, because it's the cores that can impose their, their um, conditions on any form of decoupling, and it's the weaker parties that have to go along with it. That's the short answer I did. But I've got to think about it a little bit more. Yeah, OK. Uh, the question, uh, quite valid, that uh, while there was a lot of pomp and ceremony around uh, the visit, quite unprecedented, um, but uh, uh, that would your judgment be that with respect to some of the issues that are very uh, close to the heart of President Trump, and, and the trade issue, uh, tariff issue is certainly one of them. Uh, all this changes nothing uh, with respect to... I don't think it changes anything. I think, I think that, that we know what President Trump wants in terms of trade deals. We've now seen a number of them uh, over the last several years. Uh, we saw the, the so-called amendment of NAFTA, right, uh, in which the President got a new name for a treaty and a few concessions. Uh, by Mexico and, and Canada, but not dramatic changes in the basic arrangements for NAFTA, in which we have the interim agreement with China, in which China agreed to buy a bunch of things from the United States, but didn't dramatically change the terms of trade. Mm -hmm. and, and then finally, the U.S.-Japan uh, trade agreement that was reached um, last year, which again, you know, some mm -hmm. modest transactional adjustments. And you know, I think that, that, that I mean, it's either a good news or a bad news story, depending on what you're looking at. On the one hand, um, the president clearly favors bilateral trade deals feels that we can use our leverage to get things. On the other hand, he's clearly satisfied with non-systemic reforms, right? In which, mm. in which you know, modest division of the pie okay. and behavior, you know, is favorable to the United States is fine. And I think, you know, if I have no idea what Prime Minister Modi and the government here wants to do, but I think what Prime Minister Abe did shows you what, what you, the, the, how much, how little you have to do to satisfy the president in terms so, uh, of giving him a take, trade deal. Take the tariff off the Harley Davidson. Yeah, exactly. I mean, no. it's so. I, I think that <laughs> this is. I mean, it. And and as, I mean, from my perspective, that's a lot better than what are the other alternatives, right? Because sure. it it doesn't. It isn't as fundamentally disruptive as, as some things yeah. might otherwise be. That having been said, I mean, I do feel strongly that that you know, the 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 cost of this um, is this is the weaponization of trade, uh, which I think. My only disagreement with you, on Frank, is, is that I think it's a short-term advantage, but I think over time you lose that because countries will start to insulate themselves from sure. the ability to be weaponized. Yeah. So, um, you know, I, I understand why it, it's attractive for governments like Japan or China or Mexico to simply say, all right, we have to swallow our pride a little bit, we give a little of these things, but if uh, it's the price of sustaining a good relationship with the United States, fine. Yeah. Uh, and uh, and that's just a choice. So, it, would you say that uh, perhaps this kind of a uh, tactical response by giving in a little bit here, there, mm. the areas where Trump has a, mm. has demonstrated interest, uh, is all that is perhaps required? I, I, you know, I, I don't want to speak for the administration. I just, <laughs> okay. you know, it's you know, the past past performance is no guarantee of future returns. Yeah, sure. but, but what we've seen time and time again is that, that the administration starts off with claims about need to fundamentally reform IPR yeah. and all these things, 
at the end of the day, the agreements are far less, yeah. are not as far okay. reaching as. Yeah, point taken. Uh, and uh, the aspect, very important aspect that uh, uh, Ambassador Surendra Kumar remained. Are we in danger of losing the very valuable bipartisan consensus that had been built up over the last couple I, I of years? I don't think so. I mean, yeah. I, I think there, there's obviously different views in the United States about some of the very uh, challenging issues that are being faced in India here, both with respect to um, Kashmir and, and the citizenship uh, arrangements. But I think that Americans have sort of a, a, a sense of the deeper set of issues. Uh, you know, sometimes we disagree with the policies of fellow democracies in terms of what they do, but there's sort of a sense that the relationship is bigger than the, the policies of any particular So that is still intact. And so I would, I would say, I mean, I think it is good news, and, and mm -hmm. I have my own views on these questions, but I don't think it is, it is fundamentally disruptive of the kind of the strategic relationship between the United States and India. Okay. But I think there are lots of good reasons for that. Okay, that's stuff. a relief. Uh, capitalism in crisis, uh, do you have... <laughs> You know, I, no. I mean, I, I, th I think, again, I, I agree with the point that, that our publics need to be convinced that the, the current economic system generates benefits not just for the wealthy but for everyone. But I don't think it's fundamentally a crisis of capitalism so much as the accommodative policies that governments need to do to support capitalism. Yeah. Okay. So I have time only for one more question. Yes, please. Good morning. My name is Daksha. I'm an under, undergraduate student of history and international relations. My question is pertaining to the climate change negotiations. So in this debate of historical responsibility of the developed countries versus the current or future responsibility of the developing countries, mm. how do we substantively tackle with climate change if the top-down approach is stuck with um, protecting their national interests? Mm. Would you like to... I can say so it's not my field, but I can say something about it. Um, it's not limited to developing countries versus developed countries, right? The United States is not playing ball with climate change policies either. Um, and the, yes, the, the, the issue of, of national interest is, is paramount. Um, I personally think that because of that and because of developing countries having this legitimate need to further develop themselves, which will have a climate impact, we have to brace ourselves for more rather than less climate change in, in the future, and we have to put our money less in trying to reduce emissions and more dealing to mitigating the, the dire consequences of it. But that's so not an issue. So I, I, I'm not a climate scientist, my wife is, so I, I, at least I imbibe this at home. I, I'm not sure I agree with you on this. Right? I think that, that there is a significant opportunity uh, for mitigation, and I think the big change, and again, this is why I'm a, in favor of Paris despite all these things, is that ultimately what is going to make the change is, is technological conversion. And that will happen when firms and others begin to feel that it is inevitable that we will have to make these changes. And so they're in anticipation of they're going to begin to make the capital investments and the research investments that make the change. And so what we need to do is create a path, even if it's not an optimal path forward, in which people see that the direction is a way toward, towards carbon neutrality and that, that, that will lead to the incentives for people to try to get see, ahead of that. Do you see some signs I think of that there, are, there are positive yeah. signs of okay. that happening, and I, and, I, and I see some of that transformation, but I think that you know, the government policies can be supportive of that, and clearly and regrettably, our country is not leading the way on that. <laughs> okay, okay. Uh, a little more encouraging note to end this uh, session on. I, we are completely out of time, so I know there were a few other hands uh, for questions, but I'm sorry, uh, we just don't have time for that. Thank you Great. very much, uh, both our uh, panelists. Jim, always a pleasure to thank have you, this with you. Yep. And Frank, thank you very much for coming. Thanks to the audience. I please give them a big hand.